So all I do, my, my secret, is I suspend my disbelief long enough that I can put an effort forward and see if it works. Right. I, I might not believe that I can transform my body. I ran a marathon last year, or I guess 2019 now. I ran a marathon in 2019. I didn't believe I could run a marathon. Mm-hmm. But if I, could, if I could suspend that disbelief for long enough to get a mile in, and then two miles in, and then three miles in, I start to gain evidence. Despite the fact that I don't believe in me, I have the evidence that something is happening. Mm-hmm. And I can lean on that enough to keep going. Welcome to The Carla Rand Show a weekly podcast designed to dig into the lives of everyday people. People who are making a positive impact. People who have risen above and overcome obstacles. Insights and stories from ordinary individuals who inspire us all towards the truly extraordinary. Here's your host. Hey, it's Carla. I just got to talk to Craig Bongelli. And oh my goodness, this guy, Like, I was so excited to talk to him. And the conversation was just what I was hoping for. He's so articulate. He does such a good job at communicating and like making sort of maybe more abstract principles and concepts like really relatable. So we talked about a lot of his nutrition and fitness coaching about why everything is his fault and how what his view is on that and how it's very helpful because he takes away a lot of the excuses. And then we ended with talking about masculinity and men. And I feel like this is a topic that we don't talk a lot about, it seems like, in our society. So it was such a great conversation. He had so many good insights. And you may not agree with everything he says, but I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. All right. Well, I have Craig Bongelli here with me, and I'm so excited to talk to Craig. Craig, I think this is going to be a really fun conversation, and I've been looking forward to it for a couple of weeks. I'm just like, I can't wait to talk to Craig because I've been kind of following you on Facebook and listening to some of your talks and stuff. And I'm just like, man, you're so good at like articulating what you want to say. And I just I love your messaging around like fitness and nutrition and all the other stuff, mindfulness, mindset stuff that you talk about. So thank you so much for being on the Carla Rand Show. Welcome to the program, Craig. Thank you very much. I'll try not to let you down with that intro. This will be the day I start stumbling through everything. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. All right. So let's start with giving people some context. Um, I'll just tell them that you're a fitness and nutrition coach. Is there anything that you want to add to that? Is there like, what's your specialty, Craig, when it comes to that? Like who, who do you attract, I guess? That's a good question. I started out my coaching career very quickly once I got out of commercial gyms and opened my own. Working with elite athletes, I trained Olympians, world champions, some people for the Miss Olympia, things like that. And now, to be honest, I I typically seem to attract like A-type personalities who are very diligent and successful in all areas of their life and are looking to pick up the the body component to add to that. So I would call them like normal people Mm -hmm. compared to, say, the athletes I've worked with, but people who are experiencing a lot of success in most of the other areas of their life outside of their body. Got it. Got it. Cool. I love that. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Craig. Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about your family, that kind of stuff. So I grew up in a a city called Kitchener, which is just about an hour outside of Toronto in Canada. Um, My family was pretty normal. My parents split up when I was 13, 14, and that caused a lot of turmoil in my life in all aspects from there. But up until that point, pretty normal. I was an average kid into martial arts from a young age not overly inclined to do well in school, which is something I definitely regret now. Mm. Um, and and got into weightlifting around 17 years old, became a trainer at 19, and have been rolling from there. Wow. So you started it right kind of quickly. What, what got you into the fitness and nutrition, like, or the fitness p- specifically? Why did you start working out, Greg? So when I was 16, 17, 17, I was boxing full-time as my my hobby. And I was this height I am now, I was about six foot one, and I weighed 150 pounds. And I went to the Fergus Highland Games, which is guys flipping telephone poles, throwing rocks, it's like the the original Olympic um, field events. Mm -hmm. And I met Scotland's strongest man. He was six one like I was, but he was 270 pounds, covered in tattoos. And I felt like I got struck by lightning. I, I was like, this is the first time I've seen a man. Like, and this is unbelievable. Um, so I quit boxing the next day, um, spent the rest of my time learning everything I possibly could about how to get big and strong with the goal of being like Scott the Strongest Man, being a professional strongman. Wow. And then where did you go with that? Because I know you, you've had, so, like, you've been in some competitions and stuff. So how did, how did that all play out? So it took me about five years to go from my start weight of 150 pounds to 300 pounds. And I often ultimately topped out around 315, 320, competed as a professional strongman in Canada, competed at the World Amateur Championships, 
Um, so ended up doing the thing I wanted. Got a tattoo inspired by the some of the pieces I saw of Scotland's Strongest Man. It was a really incredible experience that's given me way, way more than just muscle. Yeah. Good. And I like the diligence and the discipline it takes to reach those kind of goals must be like, what did that do for you mentally? Because obviously, okay, your 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 body's blowing up, you're getting strong, but how, like what did that do to your psyche? How did you how did you cope with I guess the pressure of and like just the rigorous schedule in order to like how much were you working out and, and that kind of stuff? So I was working out somewhere between four and five days a week on average, although it's the diet. It's eating seven, eight, nine, ten thousand calories a day. That's the grind of trying to get really big. Mm. Um, but the biggest mental gain, the biggest thing that that taught me, um, which is truly, I think, profound about changing your body, is you can take an idea in your head that is not reality today. Mm. How you look, what you weigh, what you can or can't do physically, what you can lift, how you can run, whatever it happens to be. You can take something that today is impossible. When I started out, you could put a gun to my head and ask me to deadlift 700 pounds. I couldn't do it impossible. And with enough work and time and effort, you can bring those things into measurable, tangible reality. Um, and, and you can see it every day. You can live in it. Mm -hmm. That's the most incredible lesson I think anyone can take out of transforming their body. You can make something impossible today possible. You can pull that out of your head and bring it into your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know I work with a lot of women and they're kind of, well, I'm not really the athletic type or I've never really been that, you know, I was never really playing sports and I'm just kind of like, you know what, there's like, that doesn't matter because we all have that athlete in us and it's really more about what do you want to be, not what were you. Like we can, we can recreate those thoughts in our head and, and actually help us achieve our goals, right? Completely. And most of us have no idea. When I was 150 pounds, Everyone around me told me I didn't have the genetics to weigh 200 pounds. Mm. When I was over 300 pounds, everybody told me how easy it must be because I had the genetics to just be big my whole life. And then when I decided to get smaller like I am now, everybody told me, oh, you're never going to be lean and muscular. You don't have the genetics for that. You have these strongman genetics. People will believe you have the genetics you're presenting. Yes. And as soon as you do something different, they'll go, oh, that must have been easy for this person. They mm -hmm. obviously have the genetics for that. Right. But it, it's rarely the case. Yeah. So, so Craig, what made you like continue, like what, where did you get that determination and that drive from? Because it takes a lot of work to go from 150 to 300 pounds and to do that over five years, that's a grind. <laughs> that is a marathon, not a yeah. sprint. Uh, to be honest, I hated where I was every day. I wasn't accomplishing or living the thing that I wanted. I hated it. Mm. I hated what I saw in the mirror. I hated what I saw on the scale. I hated the pounds I lifted at the gym. I despised it. Mm. And I hated it more than I hated the work I had to do to change it. And that was it. I lived in that, which I think I can look back now and debate whether or not I could have had a slightly healthier perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, a, a super politicized famous psychologist, Jordan Peterson. And he talks about setting your goals. And he talks about the idea you need something you're, you're running towards, but you need something you're running away from as well. And then however powerful one of those are, that might be your main focus. For me, I hated where I was so much more than I hated the running to get to where I wanted to be. And that mm. pushed me hard. Yeah. Yeah. So what obstacles did you have to kind of overcome, Craig? Because it sounds like, oh, you know, must be easy for Craig. He was 150, got to 300. He just he just worked and ate a whole bunch of, of food and like he, he did it. Like, were there some obstacles down along that way? And maybe even, Craig, we want to go back to when you were younger. You know, maybe there's some obstacles there that kind of came up for you or maybe or keeps coming up for you. Whatever you want Completely. to share. Yeah. Completely. So obviously the, the main obstacles that everybody thinks about are are truly the easy ones or the simple ones. You have to go to the gym and try really hard. You get injured sometimes. You have to eat things you don't want to. And we can talk about that. But I mean, everybody understands the deal. Everybody who's gotten up on a Monday morning and not wanted to go to work mm -hmm. knows that feeling. Yeah. The hardest things for me, um, I would say maybe there's three of them. Um, one, I didn't feel like I had any support. Um, the people around me, the closest I could get to support were people who were indifferent about what I was doing. At least that was my perception at the time, especially being a young man. Um, number two, I didn't believe that it was possible. I, I truly didn't believe what I was aiming at was possible. And that's been consistent in my entire life and everything I've done. And we could talk about that idea. 
the closest I could get to believing in myself and my, my mantra now is that you have to suspend your disbelief long enough that you can get some evidence of what you're doing is working. Mm. Um, and finally, this goes back to my parents splitting up and what my life turned into at that point. I was living in poverty um, from about 14, 14 to 19. I was like broke, broke. Um, so putting together the resources I needed to do these things. I remember when I was just starting out, there was a, a building not far from where I live now that's since been gentrified and it's quite nice, but it was a hole. And there was a judo club in there and they had this small little weight room. And I think the owner understood that I had no money. I don't know if it's how I came in there, how I acted, how I dressed, how I talked. Um, never one time would he take my money for a membership. He gave me a key to the building. So I showered in there in the morning, but the building, there was blood on the floor. There were blood on the weights. The shower had this broken window in it. So in the winter, I'm looking out into like the Canadian downtown freezing. Um, but really the financial resources to one, dedicate to doing what I wanted to do. And two, to not have all of that stress piled on me all the time where that's another thing that I was worried about um, was definitely a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's crazy. So I bet you had to overcome some mindset sort of limitations. Cause if you went from being broke and then all of a sudden you're trying to be successful and do all this, was there some sort of like ideas that you had about, about money or success that kind of you had to get over Craig, or was it kind of an easy transition? Uh, to be honest, I don't know if I'm over it now. Okay. Um, I, I still lean into the idea. Um, and I still believe deeply, whether it's I've learned multiple languages. I've started businesses. I've made investments. I've in the since the lockdown started, mm -hmm. yeah, and well, I guess it's last year now. Since the lockdown started in 2020, um, I ended up spending like, out of my bank account over six figures on different investments, trying to be as aggressive as possible. Um, and even that idea, I've never believed I I could be in a position to make investments that way. And all I've been able to do, the closest I've been able to get to shifting my mindset is not disbelieving it so much that I can't try it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm processing that right now, Craig. Say so that, say my, that one more little, time. Say that one more time. Yeah. So all I do, my, my secret is I suspend my disbelief long enough that I can put an effort forward and see if it works. Right. I, I might not believe that I can transform my body. I ran a marathon last year, or I guess 2019 now. I ran a marathon in 2019. I didn't believe I could run a marathon. Mm -hmm. But if I could if I could suspend that disbelief for long enough to get a mile in, and then two miles in, and then three miles in, I start to gain evidence. Despite the fact that I don't believe in me, I have the evidence that something is happening. Mm -hmm. And I can lean on that enough to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'd, I'd like to just keep talking to you about this. I'm like, oh, man, like you got you got to coach me, Craig. This is so good. This is so good. But let's yeah. kind of move on from that. Um, with this one thing that you said before when we were when we were chatting, um, you know, before before we were recording and stuff, you said that everything is your fault. Can you explain that a bit? Why is everything your fault? Or we could switch it around. Why is everything my fault? Why is everything our listeners fault? <laughs> Tell <Yeah>. us. <laughs> um, so I don't typically look at any belief, um, apart from very, very few things, in terms of right or wrong. I look at beliefs in terms of effective or not effective. I look at actions in terms of effective, not effective. I don't, I don't really care what's right. Again, outside of maybe like a few moral things that are pretty hardline mm -hmm. correct versus not for me. But in terms of a belief like everything is my fault, if I choose to believe that everything is my fault, if I take supreme responsibility for everything that happens in my life, then I'm giving myself the gift, in my opinion, of as much control over my life as possible. Because as soon as something isn't your fault, if something's just happening to you, then you just have to go with it. Mm -hmm. if, if you're just floating in the ocean, being beaten by the waves, and the ocean is not obviously under your control, then you just have to accept it and hope for the best. Now, if you believe that in some way, you are in control of the ocean. You have another option other than just waiting for it to subside, and that's to do something about it. You have the option to take action. So by looking at my life, I'm like, okay, everything that I see in my reality, everything that I experience, everything that happens to the people I care about 
is my fault. If I believe that, what actions can I now take? And you can take a lot more action than you think if you believe that you can control everything or at least have the responsibility to. To, to make an effort to control it or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. I said this to one of my staff one time and uh, and this was this was a few years back. And I said to her, I was like, yeah, everything, everything that, that goes wrong in my business is my fault. And so don't worry about, you know, trying to do everything right. Like, you know, do your best. But if something goes wrong, it's it's my lack of leadership or it's my lack of putting the systems in place. It's not it's not your fault. And she was like, no, no, no. Like, it's my fault if I am like, well, no, not really. Right. Like, and so I have that belief, too. And that's why I thought it was so interesting, because not a lot of people have that belief. And I, I very much do. I think everything that goes wrong in my life or goes right is my fault. Now, obviously, there's things like there's, you know, cancer can happen. There's, you know, uh, different types of trauma, devastations, natural disasters. That's clearly going to have an impact. And you can say, well, Carla, that wasn't your fault. But it's still my responsibility to how I react to it and to get as much out of that as I can, whether it's like learning, helping other people, whatever. So, yeah, so that really resonates with me. So basically then you're saying there's really no room for excuses if you have that belief. Completely. And even even look at the idea of natural disasters. So obviously, if somebody's buried under an earthquake, I'm not going to walk up to them and go, hey, <laughs> you know, whose fault is this? <laughs> if we take that idea and we start from there and I go, huh, I live in a place where natural disasters are possible. And if something happens to my family because of that, that's my fault. What do I do differently from there? If I take no responsibility for this in any direction, then I just keep my fingers crossed. If I decide that this is my responsibility, and I'm using that synonymously with fault. If I decide this is my responsibility, maybe I have a generator in my house. Maybe I have a different vehicle. Maybe I keep extra food or water for my family. Maybe everybody has their iPhone location tracker turned off. So if they're or turned on, so if there is a natural disaster, I can find them and contact them quickly. Like if you start to look at things proactively, mm -hmm. as if if it were to happen, it's my fault, or if it were to happen badly. It's my fault. You suddenly start thinking differently. If you look at that and go, hey, you live in a place where there's earthquakes. If something happens to your daughter, Susie, it's on you. What do you do differently? Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, you do a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Preparation, I think, is a big part of that. And also, like with, with when COVID hit and you talked about making these investments and stuff, when COVID hit, I think a lot of people wanted to just be like, oh, my goodness, this is this isn't my fault. This, you know, I, I, I couldn't do anything about this. I couldn't see this coming. And I will say, like, I'm not trying to be like, I'm such a hero because I had my online program already in place in February. So then when COVID hit in March, I was already set up. Now, was that did I see that coming? Of course not. I was very thankful to God that I actually had that set up because I had no way of knowing that that was coming down the pipe. So when it did come down the pipes, I was prepared and I just put everybody that was in my offline fitness in my online. And so it was, it was streamlined very, very easily, right? It was, it was a very easy transition, whereas a lot of other gyms and stuff were just scrambling. But I feel like, okay, COVID wasn't technically our fault. Like we didn't see it coming, but what can we do about it? Because now that it's here, it's our responsibility to make the best of it, whatever that looks like for us and our families, right? So, Agreed. And, yeah. sorry, excuse me. Go ahead. What was you going to say? And going forward, there'll be another COVID. I don't know if it'll be a disease. I don't know what it will be. If, if you had looked at your business two years ago and gone, okay, we've had a relatively smooth economic climb, climb excuse me, in North America, for however many of the last years since the real estate bubble popped in the US and all that kind of stuff happened. Could I expect that there is another devastating economic event? The answer is likely yes. If that happens and you're not prepared, it's your fault. And that feeling of fault is what drove me to be aggressive with investments because I looked around at my situation. I was in uh, Colombia when the really tight lockdowns started happening on travel. So I took, like I cut my trip short, took a flight the next morning, I got home and I was really mad at myself. After I started realizing what the situation was, I went, cool. I put all my eggs into a physical gym location basket. And I didn't anticipate that something could disrupt that. And because of my lack of foresight and preparation, the results I am now experiencing are my fault. 
So what am I going to do to rectify that as quickly as possible now? And what am I going to do to prepare better for the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want our listeners to take away from this, like, you know, Craig and I aren't pointing our finger at you and saying everything is your fault in a way that's like condescending or something, but we're, we're doing it in a way that like, like if you take the responsibility, your life will actually be a lot better and you will be way more successful and you will have a lot less, uh, I don't want to say tragedy, but you'll just be more prepared. And so you'll have more success, I guess, in life is what I'm trying to say. Would you agree, Craig? Absolutely. And we could take a very, a very minor example. Obviously, we're using some big ones right now. Mm-hmm. Say it's a job interview. You understand it a job interview, much like life, no one cares about your excuses. And if you had a job interview next, what's today? Wednesday? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you had, as we're recording this yeah. Wednesday, who knows what day it'll be when people hear it. <laughs> Let's say it's, you have a job interview the coming Monday, and you have to be there at 8 a.m. sharp. When you get up in the morning, you're going to check Google Maps and see the traffic report. You're going to have everything set up. You're going to be prepared. And if the traffic report says, hey, it's going to be an extra 20 minutes on the drive, you're going to leave 20 minutes earlier. Because you understand that if you're late, it's your fault when you don't get the job. Mm -hmm. But we only keep that mindset in very specific things. How many times does somebody show up late for work and go, ah, there was traffic? Mm -hmm. And maybe that doesn't matter to you, which is fine. But if you were to take the attitude like, the results of this are my fault. And because they're my fault, they're my responsibility. You would plan in advance differently. You would set yourself up differently so that those problems didn't affect you. Mm-hmm. And I think the more you can embrace that mindset. And again, like you said, it's not pointing your finger. My fingers are only pointed back at me when I talk about this. Yeah. But if people want to have the most effective results in their life, my advice would be to mimic that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, even with my classes, like I always, when I had my, my offline classes, like I always started at the top of the hour. Like if it started at mm-hmm. six, we, like I am there teaching at six. And if you're late, you're late. Mm-hmm. Like there's no waiting for mm-hmm. anybody. And and in order to do that, like I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning and I had to make sure that I was, and I was usually there early because what if there's snow, right? Like what I have to be prepared. And so again, it's just that idea that if something goes wrong, I, I don't wanna have some lame excuse about it. So I gotta make sure that I, I do everything in my power to make sure that things don't go wrong, right? Like obviously if, you know, if there's a big accident and I, I, I have to detour for an hour, okay, I'm gonna be late in that situation. But anything else that I have any control over at all that I can foresee, I'm gonna make sure that it doesn't happen, right? Right, and I think if, if you were to imagine, how do I, how would I act if this was important? Yes. You would do something different. Yes. If your daughter was waiting for you, your daughter's getting off a bus an hour away and you know, you don't want her standing out at that bus stop. How would you prepare your day to be there on time? And now if you took that same planning, that same thought process, and you applied that to how do I follow my diet? How do I treat my partner better? How do I advance my career? How do I learn a new skill, a new language, read a new book? If you were to start to do that, a lot of the problems that people bump into that knock them off track wouldn't even exist because your planning would eliminate them. Mm. Yeah, so true. Okay, I want to I want to pivot here, Craig, and I want to talk about about your take on on man. Like, why do we need more men to step up? Because we had talked about this before, and you'd mentioned. I thought, oh, that would be an interesting conversation. So, what is your take on uh, on where men are today? Okay, so that's a that's a very interesting <laughs> question. That's a fun question. Um, so, my belief as a little bit of preamble is based around some of the reading I've done on the history of the feminist movement, some of the things that I admired from previous generations of men, and third, my observations looking around me in the world. So my belief is that men in prior generations, and I don't think they were perfect, but I believe men in prior generations took on vast amounts of responsibility. And as women gained more power in society, more power in their lives, more agency to control what was happening, women started looking to do something similar, which I think is phenomenal. I think it's amazing that you have successful career women who are raising kids, who are achieving their goals. But as they started taking on more responsibility, instead of men going, oh man, this is great. If I'm carrying 50 pounds and now you're gonna carry 50 pounds, we can carry a hundred. They went, well, we've only been carrying 60. So if you wanna pick up the 50 pound bag, I'll just grab a 10. And I feel like what 
men largely, and not all men by any means. I know we talked about your husband who's a great example of this. Mm -hmm. A lot of men, instead of carrying more responsibility with women, just stop doing it. And I think the easiest example that I see all the time, a couple generations ago, if I were to look at my grandparents' generation, which is something I admire in a lot of ways, the woman was typically at home, raising kids, homemaking, cooking, all that kind of stuff, and the man was paying the bills. And that was the deal. And if two people agree to that, I think that's a very fair split. And now we have women doing the homemaking, doing the cleaning, taking care of the kids, and taking 50% of the bills. And men over here still in their lane just going, well, I go to work. Like, I, I have a job. It's like, good for you. Like, that's not, all you've done is shirk responsibility instead of carrying an equal amount with your partner. And I think that's personally, as a man, when I look around, I think that's the biggest detriment I see happening in our society in a million different ways. Mm-hmm. And it's really disappointing. Mm-hmm. So what would you say, let's say, what would you say first to the men right now who are listening and they're kind of like, hey, like, are you calling me out, buddy? Like, what, what's going on here? Maybe they're feeling that or maybe they're like, you know what, that's not me. But in any case, what would you say maybe the guys that are feeling a little bit like squirming in their chairs right now? I think what every man needs to do first, and this is a very difficult thing. Um, I think in general, I think in our society, is figure out what being a man means to them. I think previous generations, life forced it on them. My grandfather dropped out of school when he was in grade seven or eight to start trying to make money for the family, took a laboring job, tried to build up in the, the construction industry in Toronto to be able to provide for his family. So responsibility was thrust on him. But for my definition, what I believe a man is, and this is, again, my advice is for men to figure out what it means to them. For me, it is the willingness to carry the burdens that life puts around you. It's the willingness to put something on your shoulders and carry it. Mm-hmm. I believe that's the basis of masculinity, the willingness to pick up responsibility. Right, rather than trying to get out of it. <laughs> Com- completely, because becoming a woman, from my perspective, and I know very little about that, a lot of things are thrust on women. Women become women because nature brings them into womanhood. Women, when they have kids, it's very hard to get away from the responsibility of being a mother, not only because you grow the kid and birth the baby, but because your body keeps the child alive. And children have a distinct bond with their mother, which I think is a great thing, but the responsibility of parenthood seems more built in for women. Whereas for men, it's more of a choice. And I think as society teaches women that they can be more and more things, they can do more and more things, I almost see an excitement over the history of feminism for women to pick up responsibility. And I've seen men go the opposite way on a large scale. So what's the answer then, Craig? What's the answer? So you you said first, like, find out what it means to be a man to you. But but beyond Mm -hmm. that, what would you say? Maybe as a society or as an individual or kind of however you want to take this. Okay, so first, this might be surprising, but I am in no way qualified to solve this massive problem, but I will give you my opinion. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I I think it'd be a great idea if we could have more conversations about masculinity as it stands as itself. Um, I started one of these on my Facebook. It was very interesting because a lot of people brought up what men need to be in relation to women, in relation to what they perceive as a patriarchy in our society. And it, it was interesting to me because I... I don't see I don't see any conversations generally about what it means to be a man as its own institution. Whereas we have we have a lot of conversations, but I think have been incredibly valuable to women about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a feminist, what it means to move women forward in society. And I think it would be insulting to most people if every time we had those conversations, we brought in, well, what a woman should be is a wife like this. You'd get crucified if that's how you started every conversation about women. Well, what women should be is maybe this, but also here's what they could do for men. People wouldn't have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But we don't do the same thing about masculinity. I think men need to start having that conversation largely amongst themselves, but with women as well, but largely amongst themselves. What does it mean to be a man? If we can open that conversation, I think we can start unraveling where that needs to go. 
Yeah, and it's funny because I don't know if I commented on that post, Craig, but I, I've done posts too, like on my Facebook feed about like, you know, what's the difference between a man and a woman or, or just stuff like that, like some gender stuff. And it's amazing how, oh my goodness, does that ever bring up some strong beliefs in people and opinions and thoughts and feelings, right? So I remember seeing your Facebook and I remember looking at it. I don't know if I actually commented because I was starting to read some of the stuff and I'm just like, ah, I'm not going to get into this. Like, I'm out of here, you know, have, have fun with yeah. that, Craig. But you're so right. Like, and I think a lot lot of yeah it's it's like yeah but you know men are doing this and women are doing it's like we didn't we weren't talking about women here we were talking about men um and not that we can't yeah. talk about women too but i i agree i think it's so often it's like yeah but what how do men relate to women it's like no we're we're just talking about men here and that's okay we can have those conversations and we're not we don't have to be offending anybody by not talking about women here like it's not just about the women it's also about the men and i think that's where the shift has come like what feminism brought in like i think what what came in is really good and again this is just my opinion and people might be really upset when mm -hmm. i say this but i think that like what <laughs> feminism brought in um was helpful but then i just feel like it's get it's almost going too far to the point where it's like it's all about the woman Instead of being like, yeah, but, we're, you know, there's still still two genders here. Um, there's still, you know, like there's still two conversations that have to be had. So I don't know. I think some of it, too, is just it's it's it comes it stems from the history. People keep looking back instead of forward. They're looking back. Yeah. But for all these years, these all these generations, we were oppressed or all these. Gen it's like, well, yeah, that that was then. But this is now. And let's live in our reality right now. And I mean, I do the same thing. I'm even thinking with my husband, like some of the arguments that we have or something, I'll be like, yeah, but you did that back then. And it's like, yeah, but Carla, you need to let that go and we need to move forward. So yeah. I get where people are coming from. But I think it's important, like you said, like, let's just let the guys have these conversations too. Yeah. I agree. I think that's monumentally important. If, if men first amongst themselves, maybe just first by themselves, can start thinking about what masculinity means to them. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in groups of men, they can have a conversation about what masculinity is. And I think once we have a better understanding of what modern masculinity is or could be or should be, however we want to phrase that, then we can also have, a, a I think, a more beneficial conversation about how does that relate to modern femininity? Mm -hmm. Like where, where, are, where are each of us going independently? And then where are we going together? Mm -hmm. um, but it's if you and I are going to run some errands together and we never get to have a conversation about the errands I need to run or the errands you need to run for one of us, it's not going to be the best day it could be. Mm -hmm. And if every time it's, I'm like, well, you know, I could really go to the, I've got to stop at the, the hardware store. And you're like, well, I don't need anything at the hardware store. Or we go to the hardware store and you're like, well, I need a hammer. I'm like, right, but I need to come to the hardware store. If you're like, listen, you already picked the hardware store. I'm getting a hammer. <laughs> That's not useful for us. Well, it's not useful for me as a person. And it's not useful for us as a unit running these errands together. Like, I think we, I think we need some more agency in terms of the direction masculinity is going from men mm -hmm. in, a, in a meaningful way. Because women, I think, are doing a phenomenal job. And I think it's very, very hard to be a woman. Um, I think when we spoke earlier offline, if you're a man and you want to be considered like an A plus check the box man, all you have to do is be good at one thing. Are you in great shape? Do you have a great career? Are you a good dad? Are you really good looking? Are you really smart? If you check one of those boxes, the whole game is done. Successful man. For women, it's okay. She's got a great career, but is she good looking? Okay. She's got a great career. And she's good looking. Well, is she in shape? Oh, she's got a great career. She's in shape and she's good looking. Oh, is she a good mom? If she can do all that, well, can she cook? Is she taking care of her husband? And as soon as you don't check one box, you're disqualified. And I think that's, that's enormous pressure on women, but I think it's served them quite well. Whereas I think the thing that's harming men is how easy the standard is. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is Bill. You're like, this is, okay, what about him? You're like, Bill's a great man. You're like, really? Because Bill looks sloppy, unhealthy, doesn't have a great relationship with his kids and hasn't been intimate with his wife in six months. You go, yeah, but Bill makes 200K a year. <laughs> you know, like, and that, and that would suffice. Whereas we don't apply that to women. And I think that burden, you know, the expression, no pressure, no diamonds. Mm -hmm. We put pressure on women to be a lot of things. And I think there's unfair aspects to that, but I think it's developed stronger, more assertive, more well-rounded women in a lot of ways. And for men, we've taken all this pressure off and we've melted. We're still cold. Mm -hmm. 
So what's going to happen, Craig, if nothing changes, if we don't, if these men don't have these conversations, if it just keeps going in the direction where women are just taking on more and more responsibility and guys are taking less and less responsibility. And I'm talking again, there's obviously huge exceptions to this, but like just in general, what do you think is going to happen? Have you thought about that? (laughs) I have. So I think there's a few different things. Um, Number one, I think women will be less and less happy with men. Um, I think if you were to watch, there's a, I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't own a TV, but there's certain like sitcoms I've seen and the dad on the sitcoms, there's one, um, everything about everything about Raymond. Okay. I, I'm not familiar with TV either, but it sounds familiar. <laughs> okay. It's something like this. And the, the patriarch of the family, the dad is this like bumbling, goofy dope. Mm-hmm. And it, and that's how he's presented to society. And it, it might be funny on a TV show. I find it repulsive. But I don't think women are going to want to live with or around men like that. I believe that strong, successful women, which a lot of women are becoming, want to be with strong, successful men, however you gauge strong and successful. I don't mean big muscles and lots of money. Mm-hmm. Whatever strong and successful means to you, you're looking for a partner that's similar. So I think first, women are going to start to get sick of this particular style of masculinity or its absence. And number two, there's a Greek expression that good men make good times, good times make weak men, weak men make bad times, bad times make good men. Mm. And this cycle repeats. I don't think it's entirely possible we end up in a place like that. Um, But to bring it back to the, the first example I gave about wanting someone who has the same level of strength as you, I think the easiest example... Um, You're a woman of faith, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it would be difficult for you to be in a relationship with someone whose faith is consistently deteriorating, who's not meeting you at that level and something that's deeply important to you. If you've got an incredible strength of faith, I think it would be very hard to be with someone who's incredibly weak of faith. And I understand everybody has their dips or their moments. But if someone consistently didn't care or was deteriorating in that way, it would be hard, I would imagine, for you to be with them as a partner, Absolutely. for you to be with them as a, a close personal connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what, whatever metric women gauge their own personal strength and success, I think they're going to look for men who are the same. Um, and I think that's going to get harder and harder to find in a lot of meaningful areas. Yeah, I would agree. And also something I've seen a little bit is, is sometimes I think these strong, dominant women, or I don't know, or maybe they see themselves that way, they tend to sometimes be attracted to the more mm-hmm. passive type guys because they can sort of, you know, like control them, manipulate them, whatever. But then what happens is they start to resent them, I think, because as they, they realize they're like, they married this passive guy so that they can have their way, but then they realize that this isn't working because I'm having to do everything. And this person is not stepping up. He's not keeping me accountable. He's not really doing anything for me. And I, I often hear people, and I joke about this sometimes, but they talk about, yeah, I have, I actually have four kids. I have three kids and my husband acts like a big kid. And I know sometimes that's just in jest and whatever, we can laugh about that. But I feel like, gee, like that's not, what we want it really and and women like they do want a man to step up and be helpful and to be uh like a protector and a provider whatever that looks like it doesn't mean that the guy has to necessarily make the most money or be gone the most or whatever but like i don't think most women want a guy that they can just control and boss around i completely agree and if we look at i'll try to make this as non-crude as possible okay if we look at the primary goal of a romantic relationship. It is centered around, or at least an important factor is procreation. Whether it's practicing the act of procreation or literally procreating, regardless, that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. I personally don't believe, and I understand a lot of times these comments are in jest, I don't believe someone wants to procreate with someone who feels like they're one of their kids. Mm -hmm. And I think when people are saying that, if people say that consistently, to me, that sounds like my attraction to this person is falling away. And I don't know how it couldn't with that type of, with that being the predominant feeling of a relationship with someone. They're one of my dependents, basically. Yeah. That's not an attractive feeling. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, man, there's so much that we could we could say here, Craig, about this, but I appreciate you sharing. Is there anything that you just want to say that we maybe haven't touched on yet when it comes to the whole role of a man, masculinity, that kind of thing? Anything that you haven't said that you'd kind of like to? Oof. 
if I was speaking, okay, if I was speaking directly to men, I would encourage them to look almost historically for things to inspire their thought process about masculinity. There's a book um, written on a short story called Iron John, which I think would be a phenomenal place to start, but whatever makes sense for them, Mm -hmm. whether you're a person of faith and there's, you'd like to read the Bible or whatever, whatever religious text appeals to you. And you're looking for the, the strings to start pulling out what masculinity means from there. If you don't have something, I'd recommend that a lot. Um, and if I was speaking directly to women, which obviously I'm unqualified to do, but I'm going to make a run at it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, again, you and I touched on this a little bit offline. Um, I think women are put in a position very often where either they feel like they're this nagging overbearing partner, um, whether they feel that way internally, whether they're made to feel that way, whether they're made to feel that way by things they see in society. My belief is that good women test men. And by those tests, if the man has the potential, improve him. Um, so I would, I would like to encourage the idea that just because I believe most men are weak in terms of their masculinity, that women aren't leaning away from putting a little bit of pressure on them. More pressure, I believe, is what men need. And I think good women apply that to the men in their life. Mm. Yeah. And I think I would say to women, just because I can, um, because I'm a woman, Mm. if you say this, you'll get in trouble, um, is I would say, you know, be careful how you do that. Because I, I, you know, there is, there is a a good way to do that and a, and a very negative way. And I think a lot of women can really, um, just like really discourage their husbands, just like husbands can just discourage their wives, you know, but like Mm. they can really discourage their husbands by really like, you know, taking them down at the level where they like, that's so value, like no, no respect, I guess, just kind of like, oh, you're an idiot. Or like, there's just a lot of stuff that I hear. And I'm just like, oh, man, like that, that poor guy, (laughs) you know, like, that's so harsh. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. Obviously, I say a lot of things to my husband. And so, you know, this is from experience, knowing like what really is going to pull him down. But like, we really want to be building each other up, men, women, like, build each other up and try to help the other maximize who they are as as a woman, who they are as a man, who they are as a human being. But just like, can we not like encourage each other and, and see how we are different and how those differences can make us better when we go forward together rather than a competition or something like that. And I think that's, that's what a largely marriage can become is a competition or not even marriage, but just some sort of relationship with, with men and women, it can start to become a competition. And I feel like I see that a lot. Well, guys do this. Well, girls do that. Well, guys, you know, it can just be, and I'm just like, why, why are we competing here? Like we are all human beings. We are all here for a purpose and man, could we sure help each other because we have, you know, the women that are, are maybe have skills in this area, the guys that typically have skills in this area, man, we can do a lot of good when we work together. Completely, completely agreed. Mm. Completely agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's, let's end there, Craig. Um, I just, yeah, I want to thank you again. Oh, actually one more thing I want to ask you, what are some of your goals for 2021? Do you have any goals? I mean, it's kind of, you know, the beginning of the year, what are some of your goals, big or yeah. small? So I set goals all the time. I set them in four areas. Um, I typically, typically review that every single week and adjust my goals as necessary, but I'm typically adjusting them broad stroke at least once a quarter, but I audit my progress towards them every single week. So I keep that year round, um, going into 2021, my four areas are body, brain, business, and balance. So in terms of my body, my plan is to look better than I've ever looked. I've been I've run a marathon. I joined the army in ace basic training. I've been a professional strongman. I've been really skinny. I've never tried to be super jacked. So I want to look like the rock. Okay. So I probably have to gain maybe five more pounds relative to my height and stay this lean. And I'm doing pretty good in terms of that. So look super jacked for body, for brain. Um, I've learned to speak Russian and Spanish. My plan is to continue my classes in both of those. And I've got a book list that I'd like to read through. Those are my brain goals. For business, I'd like to help 250 people this year transform their bodies as my primary business is being an online coach, trainer, and gym owner. Mm -hmm. And then for balance, uh, the the woman I'm seeing, uh, who is incredible. When I talk about all the things that get laid on women, she crushes all of those categories somehow. It's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. Inspires me to be better. 
as well. But she's got three daughters. Um, and in terms of my balance goal, it's incredibly important to me that as I chase all of the other goals, that I'm maintaining the time I get with her and with the three girls. Um, so I'm not, I'm not infringing on the things that are incredibly important to me for the other goals that also are important. So blocking that time mm. is my fourth. Yeah, balance is my word for 2021, Craig. So I hear you. I get you. It's hard. And like you talk about the pressure on women to be all of these things. Like, you know, I have some Mm -hmm. big goals around all of those areas. And sometimes it's hard to not let one completely crash. And I always feel like it doesn't mean that everything has to be perfect because that's not possible. It doesn't mean you have to spend 100% of your time on each thing each day. But you have to make sure that like when you look at the end of your week, did you have a pretty good balance there, right? Not just like, oh, I just completely neglected my family or man, I sure neglected my clients or whatever, right? It's got to be, it's got to be that balance. So I understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. You're, you're obviously like a real high achiever, Craig. And I think that's what, you know, that's what just really like caught my attention was like, man, this guy is operating at a level that the average Joe is not operating at. (laughs) Have you heard that before? I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard that and I take it as very high praise. I don't, I don't know if I always feel that way. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've got miles to go before I'm even starting to get a glimpse of where my potential might be. But I appreciate that compliment very, very much. Yeah, well, it's really cool. And so I appreciate you being on here and sharing this. And I mean, you had to share some vulnerable stuff because we all know when you start talking about gender, especially a guy talking about masculinity and saying anything about women, <laughs> you know, you just know that the darts are going to come out. So I appreciate you saying that. Dicey. Yeah, well, I told you too, because you were, you know, you're kind of like, ah, I don't know. But I, I said like, this is this is my podcast. And if people, they can say whatever they want, this is going to go live. You guys go ahead and comment, you know, comment. Let me know what you think. Work, we'll cool with that. Craig's not going to get offended if you don't agree with him. I'm not going to get offended if you don't agree with me so let you know let us have it we're happy we're happy to have the dialogue we just want to get the conversation going <laughs> and i look forward to that discussion yeah a hundred percent i think that'll be the most interesting aspect of this potentially yeah absolutely all right well thanks so much craig really appreciate having you on today my pleasure this episode is brought to you by my company power fitness online we are a tight-knit fitness community and we guide you every step of the way to get fit and stay fit through our live workouts, nutrition coaching, and incredible support team. Go to powerfitnessedson.com to learn more. Thank you for tuning into the podcast today. If you enjoyed it, please leave a positive review on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, or wherever you're listening. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I would love to see your comments. I would love to know what you think about this episode and uh, interact with you. I love hearing from you. Once again, I'm Carla Rand, and this is The Carla Rand Show, and I can't wait to see you next week for our next episode.